So, <laughs> most of you have probably heard we had a really exciting announcement earlier this week. Uh, Mouse Guard has been optioned by Fox. Before Mouse Guard had been optioned by Fox, I had been having some conversations with Fox. But out of the blue, Gary Witta, screenwriter for Rogue One, saw a panel of Ryan Langs from Legends of the Guard Volume 3 and tweeted, why, uh, uh, how is this not a movie? His tweet put him on our radar as someone who would actually be interested in working on Mouse Guard. So it was because of that tweet that uh, we need to reach out to Gary. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, if you look at that image, it's from the Dungeons of the God, right? It's a yeah. piece of gas art. And I had been a fan of Mouse Guard for, for a long time, and it was in the back of my mind. My sister was just like, oh, there's a movie there somewhere. But it was that image that was kind of the catalyst for it. So you just look at it, I mean, that's the original frame of the image. It's very cinematic, kind of super power vision, you know, aspect ratio, and you know, it looks like a you know, piece of concept art, storyboard art from a, from a cinematic feature film. And that's really kind of what uh, inspired me to start thinking about it. And then, it's always the date for that, like 25th January 2015. So fast forward six months, it's kind of perfect that we're all here at Comic Con. At the time, it was really serendipitous is actually an all start of Comic Con a year ago where I met with um, Ross Ritchie and Stephen Christie and the guys from Boom. Um, literally just outside the floor. It wasn't even a real meeting, it was just you know, it's in the aisle I'm trying to stay out of the way of cosplayers as they're going back and forth. And it was just a kind of quick, how do you do? Um, and I was very busy at the time, I was in the middle of Star Wars Land and many other projects and they said, you know, we know you're busy, but is there any, you know, we'd love to tell you about some of the projects that we have. And um, I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll hear it, but you know, not to give me a douche or anything, like this is very, I'd like all that time to do anything. Unless you just happen to have one of like the three things in the entire world that I would kill to do. <laughs> and we like, said, so, well, we have this thing now, Scott. I was like, that is one of the three. <laughs> you know this. And so we, we got into it from that point, and you know, we were set up a fox, and you know, you go through a process of, you know, I went back and reread all the books and had to come up with you know, kind of a pitch for what you know the movie version of it was, and that's when my collaboration with David began. I've also been watching a lot of versions, books, comics, all kinds of things like that. And generally, the original creator is not really that closely involved. And this one, fortunately, Fox and Boom were, were completely down with that. Uh, but David was very closely involved because it's something I would have insisted on. Because I think more more so than with a lot of books. Uh, a lot of creations, comments, you name it. It's very clear to me that Mouse Guy is David's life's work. And he takes it very, very seriously. And it's you know, very humbling. And I take that responsibility to you now take this and try and turn it into, uh, adapt it to another medium very, very seriously indeed. And so David was in, was in every meeting uh, and I probably spent more time talking to him. And every, like, every creative idea that I had before I committed to anything, I would pitch it to him. And uh, there was a new character that I added. And I said, you know, to David, you should name this character. And, you know, it's. It's been a very, very close collaboration. David saw the pitch and saw all the materials before anyone, uh, any of the producers or Fox saw it, and that's again very, very rare. Uh, so that's and, and that's a level of collaboration that hopefully uh, will be able to sustain and maintain all the way through the process. Because when we when we sat down um, at Fox and talked about the movie, I think you know what was clear was we both kind of felt in very much the same terms about you know, what Mouse Guard is and what it can be and. Um, it kind of felt good from the beginning. So to recap, just in case you missed the announcement, um, Fox has optioned the rights to do, unfortunately, the, the term nomenclature is live action, which is misleading. Uh, it's going to be utilizing performance capture, uh, motion capture. So something akin to the recent Jungle Book release or Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. In fact, the director of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Matt Reeves, is coming on to produce and oversee. So this is a guy who has two of those motion performance movies under his belt, who understands the technical challenges, the acting challenges, the story challenges of putting all that technical stuff, talking animals, um, and true emotion into a film. Um, so he's going to be overseeing and producing. Gary uh, is going to be doing the screenplay. Um, Ross Ritchie, who is the head of Boom, and Stephen Christie, who at one time was Arkea's uh, editor-in-chief and now does the film and television rights side of things for Boom and Arkea. 
um, are both producing. Uh, I have a co-producer credit. Uh, in short, everyone who has their hands on this thing has Mouse Guard's best interests at heart. Um, Mark Roybal, who is the vice president of 20th Century Fox, is the exec over there who championed this. He, um, we had a, a meeting in his office, and he described to me what was important about Mouse Guard. It's easy to go into a meeting where a Hollywood executive will say, like, it's great, we love it, Here's, we want to do exactly what you want to do. That's easy to, to kind of think that they know what they're talking about. But with Mark, he described to me what was important about Mouse Guard, and he got all the answers right. <laughs> so I knew that he was the right guy, and then just everyone he lined up, from from uh, from Gary to, to Matt Reeves, has just been exactly the right fit. Yeah, I actually wish Matt were here, because I think he's the other really important component here. If you've seen, uh, the one on the Planet of the Apes, the last movie he directed is doing the, the, the next one right now. I was really, it was actually, again, perfect timing because I, I did not see it in theaters. I ended up catching on HBO the week before I went to Comic Con last year. And when they said Matt Reeves, oh my god, he's perfect then. Because if you look at that, that movie, you look at that character who's seen off the back of the Cobra, like a yeah, bad ape. Um, he's a bad ape. What's amazing mm -hmm. about it is what they are then able to achieve with CG and performance mm -hmm. capture is this, this kind of hybrid form where these animals, basically animals that have living human souls are real characters that you don't think of as CG or animated, but they belong in the frame, you believe that they're there, and there's a real, you know, in a way that I haven't seen since like Yoda in the, in the original Empire Strikes Back, there's, you feel like there's a living presence there behind those eyes. You see a lot of CG and a lot of puppetry where the eyes just kind of look like, you know, like a doll's eyes, and there's no life there. And what Matt was able to do with the performance capture and with the, with the, the, the performances of the actors, is create these non-human characters that have the emotional weight and gravitas of humans. And so, you know, to, to, just to imagine that applies to David's world and these mice, again, having that same, uh, you know, kind of, those human souls, I think is gonna be incredible. Since the announcement, I have seen a little bit on Facebook and Twitter of, of some fans who I think have uh, the best of intentions, who are flattering and, and love my work, and are somehow outraged that this isn't two-dimensionally animated. Um, I just want to let everyone know this isn't something that's being done because it's trendy, because it's the current thing, or because the studio imposed it on me. Um, from day one, I wanted a mouse guard. I've been talking to, to movie people for the last 10 years. In fact, a lot of the wrong movie people for the last 10 years. That's only recently that I started talking to the right folks. Um, but from day one, I wanted mouse guard, a film, a movie, to look visually different from my drawings. I wanted there to be a, a realism, a naturalism. Um, it's kind of a silly story to have mice walking on their hind legs, talking and emoting, and sometimes singing songs, wielding swords. It's kind of a silly premise. Um, it could be very childish, very easy. And so in the books, I always try to ground that reality in the predators look very real, the locations look very real. I build models of my, physical models of my locations so that Anytime I do a rotation of anything, every every door, every window, every beam, every structure piece is there. It's that same grounding that I think that just needs to be across the board so that you can recognize a mouse character by not just their fur color, but by the texture of their fur or how it moves, by the weave of the cloth of their clothes. And that means that you're going to have to keep going deeper and deeper into the realism, uh, real world setting. Now, obviously, there's going to have to be some adaption because true mouse anatomy can't do what we need it to do. But the, the idea is that the whole world looks and feels real, including the performance, not just the visuals, not just the skin layer, but the performance of those characters. The other thing, I just want to make one final point about that, the other thing that's really important to remember is that if this were done as a traditional animated movie, whether it be you know, kind of 2D, which doesn't even really exist anymore, or kind of a you know, CG Pixar type approach, it's very difficult to make a movie like that that is for all audiences. You know, you think about animated movies, the attention is not the person for kids. Um, Mouse Guard is obviously more, has far greater literary and narrative maturity than that. It's, you know, it's for, for grown-ups as well as for kids. Um, and so this approach, you can look at something like the Jungle Book, that's good for all audiences. There's, there's real mature emotional narrative themes going on there in a way that is not necessarily easy to do in a traditional animated movie. And, you know, when David and I talk about this, we talk about you know, those mature things, you about Animal Farm, you know, which is another story about animals, but actually is a really serious political um, uh, allegory as well. And, you know, we just talked earlier about Trump. 
and you know, kind of make Lock even great again. It's kind of the, 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 the mantra of the bad guy in, uh, in Fallout 52. And so we want this to be something that is, yes, nice with swords is awesome, and you'll see a lot of that. And kids are going to love all that kind of action. It'll be a lot of fun, a lot of adventure. But we also want, you know, to, the, to be some kind of uh, literary, you know, nutritional content as well. And there's a lot of opportunity, I think, um, in Mouse Guard, not just in Fallout Winner, but across all the books to draw on. You know, real themes, political themes, social themes, things that uh, hopefully will make the, the, um, the, the book, uh, the, the movie resonate with mature audiences the same way that uh, the movies. Something that really impressed me about um, when Gary and I first started talking and sitting down is that I, I, I modeled some of what the guard was when I started working on the series based on my experience as a Boy Scout. Um, one, of the, one of the models, one of the chief ideas, there's a, there's a, a whole tenet of trustworthy, loyal, brave, uh, thrifty, clean, reverent. There's, there's a whole list of, of attributes that a, a, a Boy Scout is supposed to be, but one of the models is do a good turn daily. Um, the, the, the joke about the Boy Scout helping the old lady across the street like that, it, it's a joke, but at the same time, it's like, make the world a better place. And you don't get paid to be a Boy Scout. There's, there's nothing in it. It's not like because you have Boy Scout on your resume, you're more likely to get hired anywhere. It's not going to help you anything other than just to be a better person and make the world a better place. And that's exactly what the guard mice are. They don't get paid for this. They do it because guard, their mouse civilization would crumble if someone wasn't there to just do the right thing and make the world a better place. And Gary just honed in on that idea of service. He went, this is a, the guard mice, it's all about service, right? It's like, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, so, I, I, I really love the idea that the mice aren't, you know, the, the, the mice aren't protected by bigger and stronger creatures. They're just other mice who are small and as feeble as any others. They're not bigger and stronger, but they've, they've made a decision to uh, step in front of those mice that can't defend themselves. And they're trained, and they're dedicated, and they're heroes. And I see you know, first responders and cops and policemen and firefighters in those guys. And my original picture talks about knights that are on the table, and the, the Jedi Knights as you know, emblematic of, of characters who have dedicated their lives to the service of others. It was really like, and I was in the middle of Star Wars land, and I was pitching on this. Everything was a Star Wars reference. And said to David, you know, Everything is a Star Wars reference. To some extent, David blew my mind. I said, "Oh, Kellen one, right? He's he's the Black Axe. He's Obi Wan Kenobi to me." And I don't know how many. I'm sure many of you fans already noticed. He said, "Kellen is an anagram of Alec and Ewan, the two actors." Like, Black Wan Kenobi. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 "He's my Obi Wan now, so I had to name him appropriately." So, Gary, we're talking about how. David's been hearing Hollywood things for, for 10 years, and this is clearly the timing is, is right. Clearly the timing is right for this team behind behind the scenes. And you touched this a little bit, but why, you know, when you when you are so busy, why is right now the right time for you as a writer to get into the world of Mouse Guard? Why is this these characters in this world, why is at this moment in, in where you are, why is this something that you're excited to dig into and, and make work for the big screen? I mean, I would have been excited to do it any time in the last several years since I've been a, since I've been a fan. I've been a fan of the comic for a long time. It just you know, sometimes it takes a while for the planets to line up. I do honestly believe, and again, David and I were talking about this earlier, that you know sometimes it takes a while for projects to come to fruition because again, there's something out there, there's some universal you know geek force. I don't know what it is, but it's waiting for the right time for things to get made. And we do live in a time right now where there's a lot. Of, I personally think you know a lot of unsettling things happening in our culture and in our politics. And I think Mouse Guard is, so I try to, everything that I write, you know, whether, again, whether it's Star Wars or Eli or anything that I've done, you try to, you know, have a message, an underlying message, it gives you something to think about beyond just the, the coolness of mice with swords or a guy with a samurai sword or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, I just think the time is, is so right, you know, in the time we've got public figures talking about building walls and, and you know, being strong and being great because we're going to have uh, law and order and starting to sound like, you know, very scary figures from our, from our world history. Um, I think that there's, that there's never been a better time to have this kind of story where, you know, you see how the threats uh, to, a, to a society can come from within uh, as, as well as from without. Um, another very important question. Uh, David always talks about how he is very much a Saxon. And that Saxon is very much, that, that he is where that comes from. Are you a Saxon, a Kenzie, or a Liam? Or a Kalanor. I'm a Kalanor, because I'm a grumpy old man who has seen too much. Uh, and certainly in the world of Hollywood, and is now very, uh, not bitter, I would say, maybe somewhat jaded. 
Uh, but you still, you know, the funny thing is, that, 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 again, maybe this is a theme, but you cheated on it hasn't stopped. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, like, yeah, I think, you know, the truth that it doesn't matter how jaded you become, is how many times you get kicked around in this in this business. And as a writer in, in film, you will get kicked around a lot. Um, you know, you either quit or you keep going. And I find that what keeps me going is the fact that I just love to do this. You know, I, I, I got into this business because I grew up watching Star Wars and Star Trek and reading comic books and thinking, I want to do that. What I was sitting in front of, remember exactly the moment that watching Return of the Jedi, I was 10 years old, and that moment when the bloody Vulcan flies inside the Death Star. And I was like, whatever this is that I'm feeling right now, I want that for other, I want to do that for other people. I want to pass that on. And that's what, you know, all of us try to do. We're all inspired by the things we saw as a kid and everything. And I love for this is genuine. And again, I, I take it very seriously the fact that this is a labor of love for David. This is life's work. Um, and, you know, it's probably even, even more so than Star Wars. People wouldn't, wouldn't have thought it was possible of going into this with just a tremendous uh, sense of responsibility uh, and, and kind of internal pressure to get it right. Before we move on, I think not this is a response to a question or anything. I just um, I want to put this out there into the universe because I know sometimes that makes a difference. Because um, a lot of people have been asking, like, you know, I thought just the announcement would get people excited, and what it does is make them ask a whole series of other questions that I don't have the answers to. <laughs> uh, one of the questions, though, is like casting. And obviously, we're way too early for that. But I would just like to put out there, into the universe, that the only actor-character combination that I would bend over backwards and I would go to bat and say, this is what has to be, is that Jim Carter from Down Abbey, Mr. Carson, <laughs> is Kellen. That voice is Kellen Austin. Yeah, you know what? I don't know if physically he wants to put on the suit with the dots. <laughs> But this but man, man, that guy is Kalanox. But so. the beauty of this kind of <laughs> filmmaking is he put someone else in the suit, and then just like a typical animated movie, sure. the guy comes along and just does the voice. And that's true. You get actors to commit to that because you know they can do the whole thing in a couple of days in the studio. So you actually do get maybe the best of both worlds. You get you know, well, Andy Serkis does it all. Right, right. He's not very uh, capable, um, you know, physical performance capture actors that are running around and doing all kinds of. Crazy wise gymnastics, uh, you know, and someone else can do, uh, you know, Darth Vader, right? Who's a guy in the book with Dave Krause and the suit, James O'Dre did the voice, sure. and so, you know, maybe that's a similar approach here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so two things out of that statement were Jim Carter for Kalanon, and I don't have the answers yet. <laughs> okay.